All right, guys, we are live. A special edition of Tiger Bait Live. And look who I've got uh, on the other side of the table with me tonight. Jacques Doucet with WAFB, the Louisiana Sportscaster of the Year. And, of course, the show is brought to you by Pride Roofing. And uh, we'll talk about them a little bit later in the show. But um, I'm glad to have uh, Jacques in studio with us. He's marveling at uh, the amenities here. Um, Quite a setup, he, he thinks we're about to give WFB a run for their money. No doubt. This is going to be the uh, satellite station. We'll call this the uh, Parkview Baptist uh, Bureau or something like that. There you go. There you go. <laughs> uh, Great to be with you. Great to be filling in for the Bud Man. Buddy, hope you're doing well. Thanks for letting me have your seat for a week. Yeah, he's uh, going to take a few weeks off in the month of December. He told us he was going to do that, but uh, uh, Jacques going to fill in ably, I think. And so... Uh, already we've got some comments, and I uh, think you're familiar with this guy. We've got a chicken foot reference from Mark S., <laughs> a soundbite reference. Uh, and um, Two bands of similar um, magnitude, for sure. The lead singer in both of them, both of those bands were outstanding, Sammy Hagar and me. There you go. <laughs> My next-door neighbor, Mark. How you doing, Mark? Hopefully you're doing well. I think Mark is doing medical stuff way up in New York City. New York City? So, LSU and Purdue – um citrus bowl lsu expectations i think exceeded by brian kelly and um jacques been on the road for all of them he was in college station he was in atlanta and um 13 games and i went to all 13 of those bad boys so far so what uh what's your take on it um the last two games you know going into the citrus bowl now you know it's if you think about it, they really need this game. You don't want to lose three in a row. You don't want to go into the offseason after you've created so much goodwill with your fans and have gotten so much positive attention coast to coast by winning the SEC West, by beating Alabama and Tiger Stadium on one of the most memorable plays in the program's history, the two-point conversion, Jaden Daniels to Mason Taylor, all those great things. You would hate to go into the offseason on a three-game losing streak. And so I think it's important for LSU to win the game, to get to 10 wins. Um, you know, those bowl games, uh, LSU's not going to move into the top 10. I don't think they're, what, 17 right now. They could move up to maybe 12 or 13 with a nice performance. And it gives you a picture of holding up a trophy of some kind. Everyone's smiling. It kind of gives you that stuff going into the offseason. But, yeah, I, I don't think it's good to say, okay, Brian Kelly and company going into the, the offseason on a three-game losing streak. Uh, a long time ago in the Galaxy Far, Far Away, 1987, one of my favorite LSU teams of all time, the first team I ever watched, Tommy Hodson and company, uh, that group of guys decided that year after they had lost to Nebraska in the 84 Sugar Bowl, that debacle, the Liberty Bowl against Baylor in 85 when nobody wanted to be there and all that, and then uh, Sugar Bowl in 86 again to Nebraska. They decided in 87, okay, we need to win a bowl game. And they all got on board, and they throttled South Carolina and finished number five in the country. I'd like to see this LSU team kind of buy in that way too. Um, that was the Gator Bowl. Gator Bowl in South Carolina. That's and right. Black year, death defense. And the following year was what, the uh, Hall of Fame Bowl. They, they took the opposite approach the next year. Nobody cared about the bowl game. The late, great Ruffin Rodriguez, I remember he told me they all got sunburned. Like when they put on their shoulder pads, they were hurting and they partied. And then Syracuse kind of, you know, whipped their, whipped their butt that day. Uh, 87 team, Harvey Williams. And you did a jock talk with him recently. and They call him Uncle Harvey, Josh Williams' father played in the NFL and knew Harvey Williams, and they became friends. And then uh, Harvey's not related to Josh Williams, even though they have the same last name. And so Josh calls him Uncle Harvey. A uh, funny quick note, when we did a feature on Josh Williams, Josh Williams is a 3.5 GPA. He's going to graduate in business. And uh, Harvey goes, oh, he gets all the smarts from his mom. His dad's dumb as a rock. <laughs> so Harvey Williams also had the nickname, I think, Mouth of the South. Yeah. And so I don't think – was it is it Tommy Karam at LSU? Yeah, Tommy Caram does the media training. He wasn't there at the time, and he would have had his hands full with Harvey Williams because he was famous for saying stuff he shouldn't. <clears throat> one crazy thing, one real quick about Harvey Williams, during the earthquake game 1988, Harvey Williams is on the sidelines. He initially was watching it in his dorm because he was pouting. That was the year he sat out because of a knee injury, back when knee injuries wiped out your entire year. And uh, he, he, init he finally comes down and watches the game on the sideline wearing a red Georgia T-shirt. You know, Georgia Bulldogs. So you do something like that today, it'd be viral in two minutes, right? But uh, uh, and he jumps up. I, he's right behind Mike Archer with his hands on his knees before Hotson hits Fuller. So there's still a bunch of uh, fans over a certain age that still uh, are stewing over losing Harvey Williams to LSU. Uh, that was <laughs> well, a, uh, he shocked everybody on signing day when he chose LSU. 
uh, he was a lock for A and M that they and they all that they all thought and uh, I think he famously said that uh, that's why he chose LSU because everybody thought he was going to A and M. Yeah, I think somebody heard the fight song or something that irritated him. The Texas A and M fight song right before he announced. I mean that. I mean recruiting back then it's a whole other world, right? Yeah. Uh, before the internet and all that stuff. So before cell phones even really for the most part, but. Yeah, one of my first favorite LSU Tigers that Tommy Hudson, Wendell Davis, Roger McGee, Harvey Williams, Tony Moss, Eric Hill, Ron Santro, Nacho Albergamo. Well, that's the one that didn't Bill Walsh have a famous quote about that 87 team? He said it was one of the best put together football teams he had ever seen. Yeah. Um, James Phillips uh, with a, a comedy says, Well, the Purdue head coach leaving, does that hurt or help LSU? Well, I read that, okay, so Jeff Brom, the head coach at Purdue, has taken the Louisville job. He was a quarterback there, of course. And now his younger brother, Brian, is going to be the interim. So it's interesting that a year ago at this time, LSU had an interim head coach in their game, and Brad Davis, and so now their opponent's got an interim head coach. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how that dynamic all works. I I don't think that this game is really going to move the needle with LSU fans. It feels very similar to me to the um, 2013 Outback Bowl when LSU played Iowa. Iowa was 8-4. and four. They were unranked. Uh, in this case, you got a team that's 8-5, and five, that's unranked, Purdue, Iowa, flip a coin. You know, who's more prevalent uh, in football? I guess Iowa would, would be. Uh, but anyway, so, uh, yeah, be interesting. I, I saw Brian Broussard in charge of LSU's tickets today. He said that LSU's already sold their allotment, uh, which I don't know. That's like maybe 5000 or 6000 But American Patriot with a super chat says that it looks like I'm hiding my tree. No, it's right here. I'm just moving it in a frame for you, American <laughs> Patriot. But uh, thank you for that super chat. Yeah, now you can see it a little bit. Holiday season. There, there, there's your your holiday spirit right there. Yeah, that's there. your Trader Joe's impulse buy. Nine ninety nine, right outside. Even has little LED lights that light up for you. Can't beat it. Um, Easy to take that down too. Yeah, exactly. I had one last year. You just throw it away. Um, <laughs> and uh, just some quick thoughts about the uh, the SEC championship. So LSU's moving the ball from the get go. And so that was a big fear. You're going up against a Georgia defense that's given up 12 touchdowns all year, four rushing, eight passing. And so you're thinking, okay, we're going to need some chunk plays. You know, we're going to need some big plays. We can't drive the ball methodically against Georgia's defense. What does LSU do the second possession of the game? 14-play drive. They're working so hard. And not only does your special teams not get you three points on the board, they stand around and watch as Georgia picks the thing up and, and runs it back 95 yards for a touchdown. Now, look, a lot of Georgia guys ran off the field. A lot of LSU guys ran off the field. I heard a lot of people saying, well, I thought we were going to blow that dead. But at the end of the day, one of the 11 LSU guys needs to run and touch that thing down or somebody needs to know the rules or some of the coaches need to start yelling or whatever. So even though LSU came back right back and scored a touchdown, the Kayshawn Booty catch and run tied up the game. Uh, when you're fighting that hard and you get a 14-play drive and you give them the most silver-plattered, room-serviced, easiest touchdown in the history of touchdowns, that stinks. And Absolutely. then you combine that with the Jack Besh voodoo ball off the helmet. I mean, at that point, you're like, man, today's not our day. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's exactly what I thought after the Besh deal. Um, it's like this is how that, that it's going to be that kind of game. Uh, Dwayne Official says, ask Mike, is this a tribute to Kelly's leadership that guys are staying and not opting out of the bowl unlike under Orgeron? Absolutely. But we – look, um, you know, everybody was bracing for the portal. You know, what was going to happen was going to be uh, punch drunk from all the tweets Monday, Tuesday. <laughs> and, and no, I mean, you, you, the first thing you get is Butte coming back. The next thing you get is Besh, right? Yeah. And so – I think Besh is understandable. We can talk a little bit about that. But um, I think he did a very good job of imploring upon his players, let's have exit interviews, let's talk it out. Don't do anything until you've had a chance, I've had a chance to talk to you. And it looks like, for the most part, uh, everybody on the team has, has done that. And, and I'm wondering, when the dust settles, are we going to be shocked that there's some guys that we just thought are done uh, they're going to try and go make some money that might opt to come back that maybe, you know, is it, I don't know what Jaquel and Roy is going to do. Yeah. You know, he's he, I think he's one of those bubble kids. Or like even a something. case like Jay Ward who says I'm going pro, but I am going to play in the bowl game. Like last year, no offense to these guys, like Tyron Davis-Price, he opted out of the bowl game and he didn't play. In, or he went pro and he didn't play in the bowl game. Damone Clark didn't play in the bowl game either. So, you mean that, you know, Booty, I think, um, kind of reinvented himself a little bit this year. He made a lot of big catches this year. Now, they were kind of like catch the ball and get tackled plays. And so I was kind of wondering, had he lost a step? Was the burst not there? But obviously, after seeing him catch and dust the Georgia defense, he's got that still in the system, and hopefully they can utilize that a lot more next year. 
Uh, Bruce Steele with a super chat. Any potential late ads to this 2023 class that no one is talking about? Um, That's your department, buddy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let me let me come back to that in in a, in, a, in a few, but uh, uh, we'll we'll talk about uh, some of the guys that I expect to to be a part of the class. Um, whether or not there's going to be somebody that comes out of left field. I know a lot of people usually wondering, is there a, a Louisiana sleeper? I'm not, I'm not seeing it right now, but uh, I, I'll come back to that, Bruce, I promise. And, but uh, uh, thank you for the super chat. Uh, Kinderkamp with another super chat. Could you guys tell me how good Cecil Collins could have been and who, and who does he compare to recently? Well, I, I put this out on another – Darren DeQuano and I, the great videographer at Channel 9, we've been working on a Cecil Collins, I don't know, documentary or whatever you want to call it for since COVID. Uh, shot a uh, Zoom with Bo- Booger McFarlane and in passing just kind of asked him a question about Cecil Collins and he said, best running back I've ever seen. I said, come on, you played in the NFL all these years. You went up against Marshall Falk and he said, best running back I've ever seen. Kevin Falk said the same. I think Todd McClure said the same. Did you get Rondell Mealy? Talk? Rondell is slippery, man. Uh, he won't. He's, he's not. Doesn't want to do any interviews with us. I mean, I, I've talked to Rohan about getting him and Kevin. To I've seen him at LSU. Track him down. Not not like he's unfriendly or anything, but I just don't. He, think. But he was always kind of quiet. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, we, we but Cecil um, Kevin Falk said he had the combination of strength, balance, speed. Uh, he was he was tremendous. He played three and a half games at LSU in his in his total career. Best uh, football, best running back I ever saw at LSU in four games. Well, and or three games. It, it says something that he played twenty five years ago, and you say his name, and people still know who he, knows who he is. And he he played in a handful of games at LSU. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, he was uh, that that game against Auburn that night. Still one of the you know how could LSU on third and two call a rollout pass. <laughs> and throw incomplete and then punt to Auburn, Damian Craig and company drive what, down the he field. Had how many yards that night? And Two thirty-four because of that. Yeah, crazy. So. That was a sickening game. You don't ever have a running back run have a night like that and lose. A quick Channel Nine story: Some guy was arrested, and it was a news story. Paul Gates or whatever they were, you know, they, they're, it's the perp walk or whatever. They're walking him out, all the cameras and everything. And somebody goes up and sticks the mic in his face and says, "What? Well, so what do you have to say about all this? And he just says, I think LSU should have run that ball. <laughs> it was just the funniest thing ever because he didn't want to talk about it. And then I think Jerry Denardo referenced it at his press conference. He goes, I'm watching Channel 9. I see some guy who just got indicted. He didn't want to talk about his problems, so he said, I think LSU should have run that have ball. Have you found that? You're going to need that I, for I came your across it as hilarious, man, but I, I had to find well, it Well, Jerry again. Denardo would talk about Cecil, too. I'm uh, sure. We interviewed him. We interviewed like 20 people so far. All we got right. a lot of good stuff. Mike Haywood. Good stuff. I'm looking so, forward to seeing that. Yeah. Um, I just had to put it together. Just a this ocean of content. Uh, Trey Pontan with a super chat. Good evening, Mike and Jocks. He gives us a, gives a go Tigers, and um, yeah. And uh, Palermo Trapani says that game cost LSU the SEC West in '97. Yeah, it was back to back years. What '96, '97? LSU needed something to happen in the Alabama Auburn game, and it always went the other way, right? They needed Auburn to win or Alabama to want, win, and then. No, it didn't happen both times. You, you go to the LSU indoor, there there are banners up that say SEC West champs for LSU in 96 and 97, even though they, they didn't go to the championship game. Dane Bergeron, hey, guys, buddy's looking slimmer tonight. <laughs> hey, hi. No need to make those comments, okay? There you go. Someone <laughs> was asking for an impression earlier. Um, yeah, I, I, he that um, – you know that that was uh, you know a lot of people think that the uh, some the heyday of LSU football didn't start till Saban got here, but there was actually some really good and fun years under Donardo, and then the bottom fell out. But well, uh, you, I mean, in, in the '90s you had three decent years out of ten, so and then your last year of the '80s was a losing year, so you had eight out of eleven years in which they were losers uh, or had losing seasons. But yeah, Donardo times those were fun. Yeah, it's. Um, he 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 was. Um, I always say of all the coaches I covered, and and had dealings with in one on ones with, um, he might have been my favorite just as far as personality and, and to deal with. And of course, everybody knows that he got a little paranoid and 
Yeah. Uh, didn't like any of his coaches, assistants getting credit, and that was his downfall. I did a Zoom with him uh, after LSU won the national title, and he said it was it was kind of hard for him to watch LSU win the national title because he saw the potential of the program, and he said, I wish I would have done better. He goes, when I think about my years at LSU, I don't think about the white jerseys. I don't think about beating number one Florida. I don't think about the three bowl victories. I think about, you know, got – the last two years were losing seasons, and I was let go, and we, we should have done better. So he's very candid and, and takes ownership of that stuff. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't point the finger at anybody else. But he was very charismatic, very funny when he first got the job. I remember one time I was just a kid at a press conference, and Scooter Hobbs was asking about the drop linebacker. He goes, what you going to do if this drop linebacker don't work out? And Gerardo didn't even blink and said, I don't know, Scooter, what happens if your laptop breaks down? I mean, come on. The, the room, you know, erupted in laughter. He was really good at those, you know, answering quick with jokes and stuff. Well, you look at that 2001 team that Saban, you know, had that year with. And look at some of the names on there. Those are some, a lot of those are Donardo recruits. Yeah. Well, they were 3-8 and eight his last year. And then he was, he was actually 2-8. and eight. Hal Hunter, of course, coached that last game against uh, Arkansas. I compared that to kind of what Texas A&M did to LSU this a couple weeks ago, you know, they were going nowhere fast, but that was their bowl game. But, but yeah, they, I mean, your 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 Brady James, your Trev Fox, your Rohan Davies, Josh Reeds, there were a lot of guys that Donato left that, that Saban coached up and won that SEC championship with in, in 01. Guys, if you're enjoying the show, please hit that like button. You guys do us a favor, and y'all have been great doing that for us each and every week. And if you're not already a subscriber to our YouTube channel, please hit the subscribe button, notification bell. We're, we're loading content there all the time, and uh, – we're ever expanding uh, what we're doing here at Tiger Bait. But of course, we're also here uh, thanks to Pride Roofing. And let's hear from Mike Faraday and, and Alex Martinez. Hi, I'm let's Mike. Hear from I'm uh, Alex. At Pride Roofing, we handle commercial and residential work. TPO, shingle and metal inventory. We, we got, got it. it. Property still in disarray from the recent hurricanes and hailstorms. Insurance claims? No oh. problem. But you know Pride Roofing is the official roofer at TigerBait.com. In fact, notify TigerBait and we'll give you a free roof inspection. And on top of that, you get a free year subscription. Call 855-PRIDE-16. Se habla espanol. All right, guys, and there it is, Mike Faraday, Alex Martinez, and uh, Pride Roofing, uh, of course, is uh, the official roofing company of TigerBait.com. Call them at 855-PRIDE-16. Tell them you heard about them on TigerBait, and they're going to pay, pay for you to have TigerBait free, uh, premium free for a year. And so free roof inspection, and that doesn't mean just your home. It can be a commercial uh, entity, uh, any type of roof, steel, uh, shingle, uh, any type, uh, they're there for you. And, of course, uh, they'll do roofs anywhere in south Louisiana, Gulf Coast of Mississippi, all the way up to Jackson, all the way north of Louisiana and Alexandria, and to the uh, Louisiana-Texas border. And so based in Albany, and, of course, Mike Faraday is an LSU grad. Uh, no better people to get your roof uh, from than Pride Roofing. Give them a call. Uh, you were saying something right before we were going? Oh, I was just going to say, uh, Kevin Falk, congratulations. Inducted into the uh, College Football Hall of Fame last night. Las Vegas was where the ceremony was at. Uh, Kevin is still the SEC's all-time leader in all-purpose yards, 6,800 yards. Uh, when you factor in kickoff returns, rushing, receiving, all that stuff. And still LSU's all-time leading rusher because he played four years. So he may uh, – I thought Leonard Fournette was going to catch him even in three years, but Leonard had a – his last year wasn't that great, but – uh, so, yeah, congratulations, Kevin, first-class guy, and hopefully he's back into coaching uh, next were, year. Were you there on, at Pete's on Johnson Street? I've seen the video. I was not there. I just no. knew Jacques would be there in his red starched <laughs> Tommy Hill figure. My, uh, yeah, my starched uh, uh, dockers, what do they call those back Jabos. then? Yeah, those, <laughs> those, those. Back then, uh, you know, when I, was, when I was weighing about 140 pounds, I was buying clothes, anything that made me look bigger, you know. Yeah. Starching those, those Tommy Hill figures and dockers would blow you uh, up a little bit. Pete's on Johnson Street was a madhouse, and he was absolutely the most important recruit in LSU history, the biggest recruit in LSU history, and I say a high school recruit. Um, obviously, Joe Burrow is the most significant transfer in LSU history. Uh, but Kevin Falk stemmed the tide of all those great football players going to Florida State and Notre Dame and Tennessee. Uh, a lot of top programs nationally were feasting on Louisiana. And um, once he decided it was LSU for him, everybody else started looking at LSU in a big way. And there was a lot of schools in New Orleans that LSU continued, that had problems with that started getting those kids from John Curtis and, and, and elsewhere. 
uh, as, as those years started to uh, rack up after him. Yeah, I mean, back in the 90s, you had those starter jackets, remember those big those big jackets, and uh, walking the halls of high school, you know, it was always a, Miami, Florida State, Nebraska. You know, LSU was not cool um, at the time, and Kevin Falk made LSU cool, so – Absolutely. American Patriot uh, says, Jockey enjoys your player interviews. Great job. Thank you, American Patriot. Appreciate you, brother. And thanks for the super chat. Um, Kenny Haynes, uh, the official, unofficial attorney of Tiger Bait, uh, comes in with a super chat. He says, Mike, how the hell do we get past this idea that we might never see a five-star quarterback play it down as an LSU starter? Uh, I think Kenny is referencing the Walker Howard rumors that have been out there for about two or three days. And um, I think it's a very – it's a great situation, but it's a bad situation for Brian Kelly and Dem Brock and Joe Sloan. Um, there's – I don't think there's any way that those guys imagined that they would have all three quarterbacks. Dan, Daniels coming back because when Daniels came – when that first conversation started, when, he, when Daniels in the portal, it was a one-season deal that he would come to LSU, do one year, and go pro. Because he had already played three years at Arizona State. This, this first year is going to be rough, Jaden, maybe. We need you to bridge the gap. You know, you've got experience. You're not going to wet your pants in front of 90,000 people. You know, you uh, help us, right? And so I'm kind of letting you know indirectly that Jaden Daniels is coming back. And Garrett Nussmeyer is coming back. And so, and I think what this also is, is what COVID has done to a lot of kids in the 19 and 20, or no, let me say 21, the classes of 21 and 22, because there's now a backlog of mm -hmm. football players, and that's in, in, in probably in multiple sports, it's not just football, where you've got players that should have graduated out or eligibility is run out that are, that, that are continuing to have years. Yep. And so it's pushing the other kids back and, and, force, and stunning <clears throat> their timeline. And so... Um, yeah. I think what's happened is is there's only so many reps that a quarterback can get in practice. So a, a kid like Walker Howard is wondering how is he going to get reps? And, it, and it's a legit problem. How can Walker Howard um, win, let's say, the number two job? You know, if Jaden Daniels is going to be the guy, and I think probably Nussmeyer after what he did in the second half, despite the interception and the fumble, um, thinks he, you know, did very well. Um, and I understand he's feeling it right now. But, okay. Well, there's only so many, like I said, so many reps in practice. For, uh, for the entire fall, Walker Howard was with the scout team, which with this current roster, the scout team is probably majority walk-ons. So I say this, if you go to the spring and the majority of Walker Howard's reps are different than what Garrett Nussmeyer has, as far as trying to unseat Jaden Daniels, how is that fair? And that's where the problem is. Yeah. And, and so I thought that it was likely that Daniels would go pro. It wasn't until like a week and a half ago that I started to realize I think he's coming back. And so that I think that that's that's the problem that they have to negotiate with right now. And so uh, when they have scrimmages in spring football, well, let's say right now. Let, let's just use right now. They start practice Saturday for the bowl game. Jaden Daniels is, what, seven to ten days on the ankle, supposedly? Okay, so he's not going to be out there participating in practice. This is an opportunity, I think, to give Walker Howard a good number of twos and even a little bit of ones until you get to game week. And then you got Jaden Daniels back, you know, once he's healed up. Um, but, you know, I think Brian Kelly, you have to open up. In order to have Garrett Nussmeyer come back, he has to believe he can win the job. And I think he, he believes it. Yeah. And so you have to tell him it's wide open. There is no starter. Yeah. So, but does, does Walker Howard have that opportunity? And so that's, that's where the, 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 the rub is right now. I think you laid it out. 
I don't think there's a whole lot I can say much better than that. It's interesting to think a year ago at this time, you were Nuss didn't play in the bowl game. He had a chance to start that bowl game if he wanted to or, you know, lose the red shirt for one game. That would have been silly, I guess you could say. But I think that the average feeling out there was that Nuss would, would be the, the odd man out. He was the guy that was going to go because Walker Howard was a true freshman. He wasn't going anywhere. Jane Daniels transferred in. He wouldn't transfer in to quit. And then you had Miles Brennan, who had the experience and had shown great potential in the games he had played. So I think Nuss was kind of the guy that, that looked like he might be the odd man out. And so a year later, here he is and, and, and played his best football ever, at least at LSU, in his short period of time in this SEC championship game. You know, the, so and had he – look, you can look at his second half performance and look, you can look at it in multiple ways. Yeah. Um, there was probably a handful of throws that he shouldn't have thrown and he would have graded out bad. And, of course, he had the interception and the fumble. Um, well, I made the quick – just real quick. So, the first touchdown he threw to Malik Neighbors. So, the press box in Atlanta is in the end zone. So, I'm seeing him throw that ball, and I'm seeing that Georgia safety run over. And he jumps up, and the ball goes over his fingertips, and Neighbors catches a perfect pass touchdown. The second half was basically the same throw. This time the guy rotated over in time, and he picked it in the end zone. And then he got sacked, and he fumbled. He lost that fumble. I don't know how much that is, is his fault or not. But, yeah, there, there was the typical electric big play, the, the, the scramble to Dre Jenkins. Touchdown was ridiculous. So he throws two touchdowns, and he has two turnovers. That's what he's been, right? And he averages a turnover a quarter. But he did, you know, set a record. What was the total yardage in the second half that he had? 280-whatever? LSU threw for 500 as a team, right? And, and he, had two, had, he had two whatever. Some you guys yeah. put in the chat, but so he. he my question: If Jaden was coming back, and he doesn't have that second half, whether you want to say it was great or good or average or uh, good with with some caveats, either way, had he not had that second half, is Nussmeier may, maybe in the portal this week? I don't know. Yeah. Jane Daniels is a fascinating topic. I mean, if you gave me a vote for the offensive MVP, perhaps the MVP of the entire LSU team, I'd say it's Jaden Daniels for what he brought to the team this year. Now, is he rushing for all these yardage for all this yardage? And is he rushing for eleven touchdowns because he should have stayed in the pocket and thrown uh, or you know, thrown more passes to the wide receivers? I mean, you know, going into that SEC championship game, you got Kayshawn Booty with one touchdown reception, Malik Neighbors with one touchdown reception, Jack Besh with one touchdown reception. If you would have told me that was the case through 12 games, I would have said, no way. Uh, you know, it can't be the case. And so, you know, that'll be interesting. Uh, Jare, I guess, is going pro, but the, uh, the wide receiving core is loaded, and you got to utilize them and get them the ball. And so, you know, and after the first game, we said, oh, wait, there's no way that uh, he can run this much and not get hurt. And he stayed healthy until the very, very end and got hurt then. So, you know. Yeah, and then you got Shelton Sampson and Kai Preen and, and um, Jalen Brown and Kai uh, 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 Parker, Kyle Parker from um, Texas. Uh, you got four strong, very, very good ones coming in. And you got and a so tight that, end and Mason Taylor who's going to be great. And that's why you understand why Jack Besh got in the portal. That's, yeah. uh, he's seen the numbers and also the fact that. The LSU doesn't utilize as many wide receiver, you know, four wide receiver sets. And just real quick on that, that's disappointing because Brian Kelly has talked about when he goes in the transfer portal or he's recruiting guys, what does he want? He wants guys that want to be there, right? Uh, how many LSU fans have told you, give me a three-star uh, Jack Besh over a five-star mercenary that comes here from California or whatever and is all he cares about is the NFL. We want guys that love LSU and appreciate running out the tunnel. Well, LSU is all Jack Besh has ever known. That's what he loves. Just walk, he and Walker Howard, same thing, right? And so at the beginning of last year, he was one of the stars of the team, really. I mean, the one-handed catches, and he made the first big third-down catch of the year uh, against UCLA in the Rose Bowl, true freshman. And so I think like his first, what, eight catches of the year, they all went for first downs or something. So – uh, if you would have told me then that he was going to hit the transfer portal, I'd say, no way. I mean, I thought he had a chance because he was going to play four years at LSU, had a chance to maybe break some receiving records because, you know, he just does a lot of dirty work, catches the ball, not afraid to get hit. Um, and so I think what happened with him is he got hurt in camp, he fell behind the eight ball, and then they kind of tossed him a bone and said, okay, you can return some kicks. He's not involved in the game plan. He's only getting a few handful of plays here and there, so he's trying to make too much happen on special teams, and he fumbles. And so it just, you know, the whole thing just kind of rolled downhill. But, uh, you know, I'm sad to see him go. Kinder Camp, what happened to Tyrone Frazier, Shreveport? I'm not, Tyrone Frazier, am I, I'm, am I having that? a brain? 
Tyrone Frazier. Was that like a wide receiver in the 90s or something? Yeah. Um, Number 13 or something? <laughs> I don't remember. I, thanks for the super chat, uh, Kinder. Uh, Dane Bergeron with, a, uh, Bergeron with a super chat. Welcome to the show, Jocks. My dentist son plays quarterback for Neville. Hurd is a beast. Neville is becoming what West Monroe used to be for LSU. And, of course, uh, they're playing for a state title. Um, uh, that's gonna be. There's gonna be some very, very good games. I think this weekend. Yeah, I think we only have like three local teams. Uh, you know, I'm rooting for uh, uh, Neil Weiner and Dunham. You know, they're in the dome for the first time since uh, I think that blew me away. Did you see that coming? Dunham beating you high. I don't think so. I mean, you uh, high. I didn't see this- Curtis beating Catholic either. That's a. That is. I talked to him the other day. Um. Carl laid the wood to Curtis. That's right. But Curtis, I, I didn't realize, had a bunch of kids sick. Um, okay. But, and then Catholic beats Carr, and then John Curtis beats Catholic. Yeah. I guess they're kids. You, you compare scores sometimes, and you come up with uh, final scores in your head, and, and, and you know, you got to play the game. So, uh, but, yeah, uh, I, I've really been kind of out on the high school beat, but yeah, we got some big games. Yeah, because you've been on the road the last couple of weeks. On, um, yeah, College Station in Atlanta. And, but yeah, I'm I'm really looking. Uh, I think that really one of the interesting games on uh, this weekend is that LCA uh, STM game because that district is crazy. What you had in the regular season with Westgate, uh, LCA Turlings with a great season. STM, STM, I think, beat Turlings with 35 to 30. Uh, and they were all cannibalizing each other. And so. And a lot of dynamics there, right? Oh, yeah, there is. Uh, <laughs> with those two schools, you know, when I grew up in Lafayette, basically St. Thomas More was the only private school. Turlings was out there, too, but that felt like it was like 100 miles Broke away. Ridge. You know, and so this Lafayette Christian, I guess, has been there for a long time, but I never knew them playing athletics or anything until, like, in recent years. I heard, oh, yeah, they got this team that wins all these state titles and so they got upset last year by St. Charles Catholic and so you know Trev Falk and company trying to win a state title uh, get back on top this year but that'll be very interesting to see yeah so and then of course I think probably the game I'm I'm interested in that one but also really uh three o'clock on Saturday Manny and Union Parish and Trey Holly LSU's running back commitment I think uh I'm real curious to see how he uh, does on that he's had some games in the in the Superdome and um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that one. Guys, hit the like button, share, and uh, thank you guys for all being a, a part of the show. And um, uh, well, we're moving along here. Let me see. Let me get to some of these comments real quick. Uh, Pilar Trapani says, Besh's injuries this year, and he seems heavier, made him look slower to me than last year. He looks 4-7-ish in the 40. His only other SEC offer was Vandy. I think he needs to go to a Big 12 school, in my opinion. No, he, he, I think he is, he's always been a 4 7 40 guy. I, I think maybe, you know, uh, with some work, he could maybe get into the four sixes, but he's, he's probably m- routinely, uh, consistently been a 4 7 guy. Yeah. I mean, slot guy, possession receiver, tough guy. Like I said, not afraid to get hit, makes those tough catches across the middle and everything, and loved LSU. But he's so. tough, sure handed, um, I think there's probably been some occasions where maybe he they could have used him maybe a little better. Um, I, I if you say who do you want to go to on third and three on a quick slant, I'd want to go to him. Certainly, probably. But LSU was mostly it seemed like they were in third and nine a lot all season long. Would you say one of the most popular players to transfer? Like a lot of times, some guy transfers like yeah, a, because you know he's the, he's the kid that um, you're you're we're covering Walker Howard all those years, and you start saying, well, look who this kid is. He's throwing the ball to a lot of, of course, nil deals for of course the best name in in, in LSU football, and um, you know his parents are great people, and everybody in Lafayette knows them, and I don't know, they just uh, you know, I think I, I you, you hate to see it, but you understand it. This staff did not recruit him, right? I mean, they inherited Jack Besh. And so I think they, you know, knew he was a popular player, knew he had done some good things. They tried to make it work and for whatever but, reason. But here's the other part of it. Like, he hits the portal. But don't forget, he represented LSU. At SEC Media at Days. At SEC Media Days. Yeah, that's true. They, I mean, so he and Mike Jones, two guys that I guess didn't have the years they were hoping for this right. year, were at SEC Media Days along with Ojalari. 
um, uh, Jack's a super kid, and um, I've been here in TCU for days. So um, you have not been here. Everyone asks me, "Oh, he's going home to play for the Cages." No, you're not hearing that, are you? No, I'm hearing. T- I've been hearing a lot of TCU, but uh, I, th- I think he might have some some other uh, other. But I've, I've heard a lot of TCU from the get go. Okay. Um, Sp- special teams. You want to talk about that? Yeah. <laughs> I heard Hunt Palmer on the radio say that LSU had 41 yards on punt returns this year. Total. Holy man. So that reminded me, I think when Jonathan Giles, they had him running back punts that one year. I think it was about the same amount or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's amazing. I was just going back through the video today, looking for video of Jay Ward. His best game, Jay Ward, was against Mississippi State. He made 11 tackles. I had forgotten about, remember the kick return LSU gave up late in that game to Mississippi State? They called it back because they said somebody held and Mm – did they? You know, and so, yeah, I, I, I just think that um, your, your special teams, Slade Roy recovered a fumble against Mississippi State on a punt. That was a big play. Damian Ramos hit like a 45-yard field goal late in the game against Florida to give LSU a two-score lead. What other special teams plays were really made this year? And so then you go line by line of athletes, running backs, wide receivers, defensive backs, and you say, okay, which of these guys in high school was involved in the return game? And then you're like, and you're like that's what's amazing to me. Like, um, They averaged 19 yards on yeah, kick it's returns? Like, I mean, like even when Clyde was at LSU, I, I never thought that he was a guy, you know, on kickoff return. But, you know, that's – I think there's some trade-offs there. I mean – but now most of your kickoffs go to the back of the end zone, or they're you know, or in LSU's case, they kicked how many out of bounds? Yeah. So that, so if, <laughs> if if they only had forty something yards, it was that kickoff returns. You that said? was punt. Okay. Punt returns a total of forty one yards, and then on kick returns they averaged nineteen point six. I think I heard, which is you know poor. If you run it out, you need to get it to the twenty five or so. Yeah. So but. I you know Polian's take been taking a beating all the way around and. Um, but I, I, I think at the end of the day, it's some personnel stuff. And even the, 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 the field goal uh, miss that, or block a return for a touchdown against Georgia. Look at the Georgia players standing around. They, look, they didn't know either. It, it's just that they, it looked like the, the Georgia sideline did a better job of saying, that ball's live, get it. Well, Darren DeQuan on his video, he said, you can see Kirby come up the sideline and like, like succinctly but adamantly pointing, right. pick it up. And so, yeah, that's a, it's a tough thing to swallow, man. I mean, it started right off the bat against Florida State. Yeah, you muffed two punts. You had a 30-yard field goal block. You had a PAT blocked. Uh, the Tennessee game, you make two special teams errors, and within a blink of an eye, you're losing 10 nothing. I mean, it just, you know, went on throughout the year, really. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So. Um, all right, guys, that time of the show, I'm going to talk about uh, one of our biggest sponsors uh, each and every week, and – um, you guys know it's uh, Tony Freeman over at Assurance Financial. And um, if you're thinking about a home refinance in your current mortgage but haven't found a lender you can trust, let me tell you about Tony with Assurance Financial right here in Baton Rouge. Tony Freeman, a dear friend of mine and someone that many of my friends have used for their mortgage needs repeatedly. Her knowledge in over 25 years of experience in the mortgage industry is unsurpassed. She offers a wide range of knowledge of home loan products, whether you're a first-time home buyer ready to buy a new home or you just want to explore your refinance options. Tony can guide you through your next mortgage experience. You can feel confident you're making the best financial decision with Tony as your guide. Not only is Tony a huge LSU fan, but Assurance Financial is a proud partner of LSU Athletics. Call Tony today, 225-239-7150. Again, that's 225-239-7150. And please tell her you heard about her from TigerBait.com. NMLS number 104765, Equal Housing Opportunity 70876. So this is kind of a dead week, man. I mean, other than – uh high school games uh championships uh starting thursday um tomorrow because of exams there's no men's or women's basketball we get mcmahon tomorrow and um don't have to worry about the saints ruining your sunday because they're off they won't lose this week <laughs> you know, so uh yeah i, I thought you were on the hashtag who day bandwagon you still have the bingles <laughs> this guy right here is trying to convince me 
that who day is more prevalent or I should accept who day over who dad. Never heard who day, uh, who day uh, until like recent years. Now, I know Charles Alexander, great guy, LSU uh, Heisman Trophy finalist and all that, played for the Bengals and said who day's been a thing. But come on, man, that, that's a ripoff. It's always been who dad. Everyone knows who dad. Nobody knows Didn't who day. Didn't track that back? I saw it like where they did a, a who day versus who dad and who had it first. They might have. I mean, I don't know. I, I know that the, the entire nation was sick of Houdat when the Saints won the Super Bowl because it was everywhere. Houdat, Houdat, Houdat. But anyway, yeah, the Saints, boy, that, they talk about a beautiful disaster to coordinate and, and to teamwork to lose that game the way they did and just melt down across the board. I told myself, don't watch this game. But how am I, how am I not going to watch the Saints on Monday Night Football? And I did, and they lured me in, hook in the mouth. They start shanking punts. Mark Ingram runs out of bounds. The defense is stout all night. Looks like the old days of Jim Moore kicking too many field goals and then blowing it at the end. What can you say? So. Yeah, um, Preston uh, with a hashtag who day uh, comment in there. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, it, it's uh, – going on the front page of Tiger Bait, I, 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 I made a content item out of it so you can find it. But uh, Cowherd had Joe Montana and Joe Burrow together uh, for a joint interview, and, and that was really good. And, uh, I mean, it's just, I mean, for Burrow to sit there and have Joe Montana uh, and there's been some comparisons drawn and Montana's admiring what Joe Burrow is doing as a player. I mean, it's just the, the book on Joe Burrow just continues to get written and it's. Um, Joe Burrow's 25? I think so. So he was born in 1997. He's younger than George's quarterback. Stetson, yeah. So what I'm saying, what I'm getting at is, that, you know, he, he's not like us. He didn't grow up in the 80s and watch Montana, you know, play and win those Super Bowls and everything. But I'm sure Joe, as much as he loves football, has watched the YouTube videos and knows his football history. So that's a cool interview to line up. He at least saw the Dwight Clark, right? Yeah, the catch, the 1981. Yeah, he's, he's probably seen that a few times. Yeah. Um, it was funny. I read a book years ago. Sal Palantonio wrote a book, Most Overrated, Underrated Things, and and he said that catch was overrated. He said that Chris Berman just blew that thing up and pumped it, pumped it, pumped it on ESPN. It wasn't that great of a catch and blah, blah, blah. But anyway. Well, uh, Berman was on the, the, the 49ers payroll. Yeah. Now you sound like Kevin Foote now. Yeah, uh, there you go. <laughs> but uh, – uh, well, Joe doesn't do a whole – he doesn't like to do media. When he does it, he'll do it well and everything. But Joe Burrow does not seek out cameras and all that. No, he doesn't. He, he's – like when he came down last year for the spring game, he didn't talk to LSU. He didn't do an the, interview with them. I think that the most uh, – uh, the, the biggest uh, media thing that he did even at LSU his, his final year was the, the morning after with the guys at uh, – pardon my take, right? Uh, that kind of, yeah. you know, where he was <laughs> admittedly what hung over. <laughs> um, um, but I think he likes little, little things like that. And the thing about the, his relationship with Cow Cowherd, where they're on together every week now, you know, Cowherd was a guy who was always in the draft saying he's not not going to be this and that. And, uh, and, of course, you know, now Cowherd's hooked his wagon to him. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we were in it every day and covered it every day. I mean, his interviews that 2019 season when he sat down and it was just this perimeter of lights and cameras and media, national people to hear Joe Burrow speak and I'd have family and people, what's he like, you know? I'm like, well, I don't really know what he's like. He sits down, does the interview and he gets up and he walks off. I probably know his parents better than him, but it's just amazing to look back on. I was going through some old clips as WAP is about to celebrate, I think, their 70-year anniversary coming up, and they want different videos from over the years. And the night he won the Heisman, I did this look live with Coach O, and Coach O put his arm around me, and, you know, it was just a great, great moment that night. You know, the, you know, I got to win the Heisman Trophy, but, you know, we still got to win that title, you know. And so it's just – it's amazing to look back three years later that all that happened, you know. It's just an amazing time. Carl Dunn with a super chat. Carl the Cat. Said high school finals start tomorrow. Thoughts? Uh, Buddy says that Carl the Cat is now securely in the top 40 of <laughs> local area refs. He's moved up in the rankings. Well, Carl, you should be moving up because what I hear is harder and harder to – the officials are dropping off. It's like my dad used to say about the people that would play Cajun music. You know, they were dying off. We've got to recruit some more. Well, the officials – a lot of them are getting out. I mean, I remember we, we went up this year to do a, a feature on Jare Jenkins and Gina, and they said, we have a game tonight. I'm like, it's Thursday. Why are y'all playing on Thursday? Oh, there's an official no, no, shortage. No, you yeah, know? there is. Um, and so he says, uh, thoughts on the high school finals that start tomorrow. We, we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier and uh, because Jacques 
uh, has been on the road uh, the last two Fridays. He's kind of playing catch up a bit. And like he said, there's there's not a whole big number of local area teams that WFB in the area that are in the dome. We cover Lutcher. Uh, they're in a the state title game. And their coach, we're going to see it tonight because we're doing our player of the week stuff. But uh, their quarterback, DeWanye Winfield, has got three offers, and they're all uh, Southland Conference teams in state. I think it's McNeese, Nichols, somebody else. Southeastern, and uh, he ran for 331 yards in the last game, five touchdowns, and and so they they are pleading, hey, can this guy get an, an FBS offer from somebody? So we'll see. But Dwayne Jenkins has coached a share of great football players at Lutcher and St. James. Thanks for that super chat, Carl. Guys, a uh, big group in here tonight. Thanks all you guys tuning in. Please, if you uh, if you're enjoying the show, hit that like button. You really help us uh, with the YouTube algorithm and. Uh, uh, much appreciate Jock going to be in here for another 10 minutes or so. And then he's heading back to the studio. He's got uh, sports cast to do tonight. That's right. I want a Jordy Collada show this morning, too. I mean, I'm just. Man, he's making the rounds. I'm just, you know, talk about the guy with no life. Parker over here is getting restless in his cage, too. He's like, Mike, wrap this up. I've been. I've been. He, he finally gets to see the spread here that I got uh, Parker crated <laughs> across the room. My drums across from the, uh, the table here. And. Um, uh, full-on bachelor pad set up and looks like I need about a, a whole maid crew to come in here and clean me up. Uh, this, uh, this is where you, are, you do your Alex Van Halen and um, Neil, Neil Peart over yeah, well, here? Yeah, uh, Alex cheats. He's got a drum machine. <laughs> he didn't play hot for teacher that, that way? Did that you was... see that mashup today? Uh, you sent it. I sent it to line. you. Oh, there's a Van It's on my Twitter. You guys go check that out earlier. Bill McClintock, who's famous for those YouTube mashups. Did uh, Felice Navi died and ain't talking about love. And it's well done. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> knows Jock's a big Van Halen guy. Well, there He's Van the, Hagar. The, uh, big Sandy As Mark fan. S. said uh, earlier in the show. Greatest hard rock band in American history. The mighty Van Halen. Uh, Kinder Camp with a super chat. Thoughts on Coach Prime. Can he win at CU? I loved his um, opening press conference, but it seemed like he's, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of media and, and – um, saying he's abandoned HBCUs and what to think of it. And uh, some people didn't like the way he addressed the Colorado team. Um, so, but last night, Preston had Brandon Taylor on. And so I got in the chat and I said, I, knew, I thought of Brandon because Brandon likes that kind of stuff. He likes old school, you know, don't put up with nothing style coaches. And he loved it. And I think most people liked it. Um. Nick Saban once said, people make a big deal about my motivational tactics and my organization and all that. that. That's great. But the bottom line is I get the best players to win. And so it's obvious right away that Colorado is going to get some talent that they have not had in a long, long time up there. The question I have is, what does Dion know about truly running a program where the NCAA is going to be watching you a lot harder at Colorado than they are at Jackson State and whatnot? And so um, Dion is a Hall of Famer. He certainly knows the position, but he is not – he's never been a coordinator. He's not a mind, right? He's not a defensive coordinator. He's not an offensive coordinator. So I think he can work if he gets two good coordinators. So I guess this is what they used to say about Coach O, right? Get two good coordinators in place, be the CEO, the face, get the talent in, and, uh, and let's see what happens. I mean, they can't get any worse, right? The way they won in 11 last year or something like that. And they're paying him five, six million a year. To be the coach there, and so he's um. I, I've seen stuff in the past where they talk about Colorado and why aren't they this and um, talking about one of the more beautiful campuses and areas of the country. You know, if you can just get kids to visit, um, but he, I, I think he's going to have some success. He's taking some heat because there's a guy that works at our station, Perry, r reporter with us, big Jackson State fan. Uh, man of color who says, look, you know, criticizing him going there is one thing, but when he comes and he comes to Jackson State and says, this, this is my calling from God and, you know, plays up the, the religious angle of things, why he's there and whatnot, and then, you know, and then, and then goes. So, um, uh, Colorado, uh, uh, Boulder's a very white, affluent city, so, you know, that, right. that's, a, that's a big change from where he was and all that. I don't want to get stamp, step on a landmine talking about race, but those are some of the things that, you know, have been brought up. Yeah, I've seen it. Uh, uh, all the news networks have had panels on them, and 
people talking about sports that uh, I, I tune in a few of them and then they they don't know what they're talking about. But yeah, I, I, it's I, I thought of that immediately, and it's but it's it's kind of like Deion Sanders is a guy unto himself. There's no one else like him. So when he went to Jackson State, it was a whole lot of he's gonna. What did he say? I, I, I provided the blueprint. Well. There's not uh, uh, like 20 Deion Sanders out there that are willing to go, that are wanting to coach football in, in HBCU. I didn't know a lot about it. I thought it was a gimmick. I didn't think the guy knew how to coach, to be honest. He'd been on the NFL network and stuff, you know, and all of a sudden he's the coach of a college team. Uh, I remember the very first game he coached at Jackson State, the big thing in the post game was somebody stole my stuff out of the locker room. You know, somebody stole my stuff. So it was always about Deion. Me, 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 I, I, I. I mean, I never forget when. Uh, we, the, the Super Bowl we covered when the 49ers beat the uh, Ra- or the Ra- Ravens beat the 49ers in the Superdome. That's when the lights went out. Went out with Beyonce and all that. 2012. And he's got Fal- uh, Falco on the set. Is that their quarterback? Uh, Falco's rock me on the dais. <laughs> who's the Who's the quarterback for the Ravens that won the Super Bowl? Uh, anyway. He's got him on the set, and he's telling him, you're about to get paid, bro. Yeah, you're just about to get paid. And all, all it was about was about the money and how much money he was going to get. Not that he just won the Super Flacco. Bowl. Flacco, excuse yeah. me. Falco. Uh, <laughs> and so, anyway. But he's proven, look, he's proven that he had success. Great record. Uh, undefeated season. And so now he's taking the next step. So all the power to Dion. Let's see what, let's see what happens. He's, uh, you know, it's, it's making college football more exciting and more fun. There's no doubt. And I think it's a, I think it's a good move by Colorado. Um, shake things up. Um, Nurse Court with a super chat. Mike, uh, what are you hearing about Jalen Williams, the running back from Mangan? Everybody's talking about him. Uh, I have not a chance, had a chance to see him, but um, uh, I, I need to uh, get down and, and finally sit down and, and, and study the guy. But I, I'm I, I honestly have not seen him. Have you seen him? Who's that? Uh, Man, a guy from Jalen Williams from Mangum. Mangum, no. I'm sorry. Can't help you. <laughs> if I did, I voiced it in passing, and it was in and out of my brain. Yeah. Um, that uh, Nurse Court is not the first person to bring him up. Um, so I need to look him up. Um, I'll get you back to my real job in a few minutes, yeah, folks. Yeah, we're about to cut loose. Uh, <laughs> Preston, uh, Mike had Jacques on tonight. You try and keep pace. Uh, you haven't uh, – uh, Brandon Taylor on last night. Absolutely. He, uh, that was a great show. Um, real quick, want to talk about uh, Alumni Hall that uh, is a part of uh, our, our sponsorship and uh, been a part of Tiger Bait uh, this month, and we appreciate that, Appreciate them. Uh, ultimate shopping experience for LSU fans. If you're going to make your holiday shopping easy, go to Alumni Hall. You can get LSU apparel for the whole family, hats, uh, Yeti, drinkware, tailgating gear, gifts, and more from Alumni Hall. And uh, to thank you for your subscription, um, use the code TBFORUM22 at Alumni Hall at Perkins Row and get 20% off your entire purchase. That's TBFORUM22. Thanks to Alumni Hall for being a part of the show. But uh, all right, Jock, man, thank you for coming in tonight. I've I've had a great time. Once again, thank you, buddy Saji, for letting me uh, take your spot this week and uh, fill in for you. And I'll be on the desk tonight on Channel 9. We got two high school players of the week that I got to get back to the station and get edited and stuff. And so I think we have an investigative piece tonight. So they cut me from three and a half minutes to two and a half minutes. So. Absolutely. Just real <laughs> quick recruiting note. I uh, said I'd get to something real fast. Uh, I like where LSU's at with Toviano uh, and Ricks and Isaac Smith, the safety from Mississippi. And um, we're looking at a few other guys. I really like this defensive tackle, Jamel Howard, that Polian is after a six foot two, six foot three, 320 pound defensive tackle. Uh, I put some film up on our Tiger Den message board today. And as you can see, Brian Kelly and the staff are doing in-home visits around the clock. And so uh, we're going to get some more recruiting uh, stuff uh, talked about on here uh, next week. But, um, and I'll be on our Tiger Den message board day and night. So go check me out there. And thanks again, Jacques. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Thanks, guys. Good night. Parker.